Welcome to our um, session this evening on the Anatomies of Touch, a panel discussion in connection with our current exhibition, The Human Touch, Making Art, Leaving Traces. My name is Eleanor Ling and I'm one of the co-curators. And I'm Suzanne Reynolds. I'm Eleanor's co-curator of The Human Touch. Um, this is our first online panel discussion in connection with the show since it's been open and we're absolutely thrilled uh, to welcome three fantastic panel members. We're very uh, pleased to welcome Jane Dixon, an artist who has a very special piece of work in the show. Um, Claudia Hammond, psychologist and broadcaster whose project The Touch Test the world's largest study on touch uh, may well be familiar to you through Radio 4 and podcasts. And James Hopkinson Woolley, who is a hand surgeon at the Adam Brooks NHS Trust and who has helped us enormously um, during the course of the preparation of the exhibition with information about the anatomy of hands. We should say that we're very grateful to the, the Charlotte's Bonham Carter Charitable Trust for their support in, uh, for our Zoom events. Um, so, uh, to get the ball rolling, we thought we would ask our panel to introduce themselves in greater detail and reflect on a question we sent them in advance. So, um, uh, if, if we could ask, uh, put this to, to Jane, artist Jane Dixon first, um, we, uh, we asked you um, and James and Claudia um, how or in what ways the sense of touch has been important to you in your professional life. Thank you very much Eleanor. Um, well I think that I mean, uh, I, I work in printmaking and in drawing um, uh, primarily, though I, I do use some other media as well sometimes. And I think the sense of touch specifically, maybe an ability to control, control touch to a high degree. It's always been something quite hard won in my practice. Um, I've uh, I've had a familial tremor in my hands since I was a child and that's always needed to be overcome uh, in order to make the particu very particular kind of work that I have made in the past and that I want to make now. And I guess I, I, I always felt a, bit, a, a little bit like um, touch interrupted, something like that. The idea that when you touch a surface and you have a tremor, um, you, you can't have consistent touch, you know, you can't grip something, you can't, um, you, you can't touch something lightly, but with consistency. So, you know, th that's something that's always been there for me. And um, it was interesting when I was preparing for this talk, I was looking at the wonderful catalogue. Um, and uh, I think it's in chapter three, uh, Jane Monroe's essay, she, she's referencing Frank Auerbach, talking about his process and the materiality of his painting and of it being a little bit like handwriting um, and something so personal and that it can't be changed. And that really resonates with me um, because it is like, you know, the, the way that you make marks, um, it, it's, um, it, it's a language, it's a language of mark making in, and it's an, an individual's creative will really, which gets translated through movement and through your hand and through specifically through the, the sensitivity of the touch of, of your hand. Um, and so, you know, for me, that idea about it being handwriting, um, it, 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 feels, it feels very, um, uh, poignant in a way, um, because at the end of the 1990s, uh, for me, it, it also got a bit more complicated because I developed dystonia, which is a neurological condition. And um, it affects, in my case, uh, fine motor control in, hand, in my hands. And to a degree, it also affects proprioception, which is an awareness of the body in space. Um, an ability to judge pressure um, and to uh, 
hold a posture that you want to have and to kind of be aware of the posture that you're holding. There's a sort of real distortion and a disorientation from your own body in that sense. And so for me, touch at that point, you know, it became something which consistently had to be renegotiated in my work. And it sort of felt, you know, like the handwriting was no longer my own, uh, if I can put it that way. Um, you know, the hand became a bit unruly and it doesn't do what your brain tells it to do. And so I suppose touch became even more significant for me in my professional life. And of course there was an emotional element to that. Um, and in 2006, I started on a, a big project of work uh, titled Regeneration. And part of that was Braille Suite, which is the piece which is shown in the Fitzwilliam at the moment. Um, and um, I think it was, it's a very different piece from anything I'd made before and anything I've made since. And I think it was a really, um, a, a kind of a reflection maybe, and, and a response to this sense of alienation that I feel in, in my body due to the dystonia. And um, so I, I think you can see it on your screen now, that's one print, it's one print of five and the five um, are displayed in a horizontal line, installed in a line. And the texts themselves are, they're very small sections taken from um, Italo Calvino's book, Invisible Cities. Um, and I chose them specifically because of the, they have a very particular physical description. That, I mean, it's a stunningly beautiful book. Um, but the, 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 they're just one or two sentences and I was a bit shocked how big Braille comes out <laughs> when, it, when it gets translated. Um, uh, so it, they're literally one or two sentences, but they describe very much physical properties and physical materials and how it feels to touch them, the coldness of something or the wetness of something. Um, and so um, anyway, th th these small sections were transcribed into Braille by the RNIB. Um, uh, who uh, kindly did that. Um, and, and then they were made into etching plates and then they were printed uh, in a process called blind printing, um, which is actually just means printing, but without ink. Um, and so, you know, Braille, Braille is a language of touch, obviously, and the sensitivity of touch, the, the, the immense sensitivity of touch required to read it, um, is, is something quite extraordinary, I think. Um, the, the physicality of the surface, um, that, that sense of sort of lost and found, you know, the, the bumps and the spaces in between. Um, and I wanted to make something which was all about description and all about um, communication and then to make it inaccessible. And so of course the, the braille is behind glass. So um, immediately, you know, we can't touch it. So there's, there's a sense of that physical barrier to understanding what's there. Um, and then there's, of course, there's the knowledge gap as well, the complexity of re reading braille. I don't re read braille. Um, and, you know, just, I wanted to, something that would express the idea of almost being shown something and then not being able to participate in it. Um, and, and the idea of the number of them was that you would see almost like page after page of something that you couldn't then participate in. So you walk past it as you go down the gallery wall. And so for me, I guess, to come back to your question, you know, the piece just has real significance for me in terms of touch. And, and my practice. <laughs> so, thank you. I think we're going to pick up on a lot of those points later on. Thank you very much. It's really fascinating. Um, uh, Claudia, would you like to go next? Um, shall I repeat the question? How and or in what ways is touch important in your professional life? Yeah. So, um, 
in a way, I spent a lot of my professional life until uh, the last uh, two years when I got involved with a particular project, a lot of my life trying trying not to touch because one of the things I do is to present All in the Mind on Radio 4, which is the programme about psychology and neuroscience and mental health. And I present Health Check on the World Service, which is about global health or these days about COVID mainly. So whenever I'm in studios, you have to not touch. So any touch that you do banging on the table, um, even though the table's got cloth on it, um, makes a, a bad noise and, a, and an exaggerated noise. So I've got very used to not touching. And then uh, a year and a half ago, two years ago, um, we were trying to think at, at Radio 4 of another um, uh, mass piece of research to do and what topic would be interesting. We'd already done research with psychologists at Durham University on rest called the rest test um, and then research on loneliness as well. And we were trying to think what's another subject that would be really interesting to do a really big piece of research on, um, but all that the audience can take part in and to then make a whole series of, of programs about. And increasingly, we noticed, and it, it was this one was actually an idea of the controller of Radio 4. Increasingly, he was noticing and I was noticing lots of um, features and articles suggesting that we were losing our um, losing touch in society and that society wasn't allowing us to touch anymore. And so we thought this would be an interesting thing to explore to see was this really the case. And I knew from uh, my work in in psychology, I, I uh, write books about psychology and I am a visiting professor of the public understanding of psychology at, at Sussex University. And I was aware of the research that had been done so far and how how powerful touch can be, how it can obviously comfort people. There are lots of experiments where they um, inflict pain on people um, and then see how they cope with that. Um, not not severe pain, but how they cope with that if they have, say, somebody holding their hand and if a loved one is holding your hand, people can tolerate the pain much, much better, which, of course, we know from our own experience of if you do difficult, have to go through difficult procedures and someone holds your hand, we know it helps. Uh, but there's also research showing that touch in the right ways can make people like you, can get people bigger tips um, and can, can, of course, display emotion and a, a single touch we know can say more than dozens and dozens of words would be able to say. So we wanted to investigate this. Um, and so with psychologists at Goldsmiths University um, and Welcome uh, Collection, who were very involved in, and funded all this and funded artistic projects to go with it, um, we launched the touch test on Radio 4 and the World Service, which was an online survey. Um, and we waited to see are people interested in spending quite a long time, you know, at least 30 minutes talking to us or you know, filling in a survey about what they think about touch. Um, 40,000 people took part from 112 countries, uh, making it a very detailed source now for psychologists to look at. And there's lots and lots of scientific papers being written up using this data um, at the moment. And we explored all sorts of things like what are people's attitudes and experiences towards touch? How does that vary with um, age or um, various other, other factors, gender? How does touch relate to health and well-being? And how is it used in everyday life? What do we like? What do we not like? How is it related to sleep? Um, and I will talk a bit later about some of the results, but just to, to give you a few, a few headlines from it. Um, we found that people who had positive attitudes towards touch had on average higher levels of well-being and lower levels of loneliness. Uh, but not everyone was positive about touch. And I, and I think that's a really important thing that not everyone likes it and we shouldn't mm -hmm. assume everyone does. 72% of people were positive about touch and 27% were negative. But when we look to see whether this had anything, uh, whether this was linked with personality at all, we found that um, people who scored higher on extroversion were more likely to be positive about touch, as were people who scored high on openness to new experiences um, and agreeableness, um, another measure. We found that the people who don't like touch were more likely to be people who want to be very independent and might find it harder to form trusting relationships. Mm -hmm. So it may be that there's things um, in their um, in their past, in their backgrounds and in their previous relationships with people that have made them feel more negative about touch as well as finding it hard to to trust people. Um, People who'd experienced touch from someone else in, in any way uh, more recently had higher levels of well-being and lower levels of, of loneliness. And we also asked people um, what words they associated with touch. Mm. Um, and the most common words were comforting, warm and love. 
Um, and people who are better at imagining touch, we also ask people how good, there's a detailed survey, a measure of, of how good people are at imagining touching different things. And people who are better at imagining touch had higher levels of well-being. And the top three materials that people liked to touch were, in order, fur, followed by velvet, followed by silk. And the top three materials people disliked touching most were slime, followed by paper, which I thought was interesting. Um, I like paper personally, um, but everyone's not the same, and nylon that people didn't like touching. Um, and so uh, we did those and we also talked a lot about where people liked being touched on the body and who by, and what touch people felt was appropriate at work and what wasn't and whether it depended on whether this was your boss and your colleague and um, and all, all sorts of other things like that and, and some other things that I can um, talk about a bit later. But um, it was absolutely fascinating to find out what 40,000 people think about something that is so so every day but that we might not have interrogated in this way and that people haven't necessarily thought about a lot of people told us how they enjoyed doing the survey because they enjoyed thinking well what do I like what don't I like well, you know why is touch important to me mm. I think that's fascinating I, I'd love to be able to look through the results of those 40,000 people um, um thank you very much James would you like to um continue would you um remind everyone who you are and yes. um and, and answer that you're the, que the same question yes so i'm uh, an orthopedic hand surgeon um uh, based at addenbrooks hospital in cambridge um and uh uh we have a pretty big department there um we have a number of hand surgeons uh, so we've got a good team and um yes i concentrate pretty much purely on hand and wrist problems whether they be problems that have developed with time or following injury uh, in terms of the relevance of touch to uh, my professional life, then uh, as a medic, uh, touch really is all important um, in terms of almost every doctor patient encounter that normally in normal times starts with the touch of a handshake as you introduce yourself to the patient. Um, and then after you've taken your history, then you'll move on to examining the patient and that a, a significant part of examination is through palpation, which is examination by touch. So yes, you'll inspect the patient first, observe them, have a look at their overall condition. And then when you start examining, first you will start almost every time you'll start by examining the hand because that's where you'll take the pulse. And it's a, relevant, re a relatively distant part of the body. So you're, you're not starting anywhere too intimate. And then you can sort of work from there as and where you need to go. But on, on touching the hand and taking the pulse, you know, is the hand, is it is it hot and sweaty? Is it sort of wet and clammy, cold and clammy? Is the pulse sort of strong and steady or is it is it sort of thready and weak and fast? Um, and then moving on from there, you might move on to either examining, examining the, the chest or the abdomen. And through touch, you're feeling for sort of abdominal masses or or movements, which might be normal in the case of pregnant ladies. Um, and, uh, and then from there, you might move on to examining joints, for example. And the touch, for example, uh, examples of, of touch being very important when you're, for example, examining an arthritic joint, is that if it's a badly arthritic joint, you can actually feel the grating of the bone as, as the joint moves. Um, that might sound a, you know, a fairly gruesome thing to, to put a patient through, but in many cases, arthritis is actually painless, um, but it still gives you some idea as to, to what might be going on purely through touch. Yeah, so, so you have the feedback as, as you make your incision through the skin, and then there's the sort of the, the, the gentle giving away of the under layer of underlying fat layer. Uh, and then as you, as you encounter fascial layers, which are sheets of tissue, which usually enclose things, you'll feel a bit of resistance through those. Uh, and then depending on whereabouts you are, if you're sort of operating on a limb, then you might finally sort of hit the final resistance of, of bone, which obviously is, is a pretty hard thing. Um, but so we, that, that feedback from, as I say, from holding instruments and knowing where you are in, in time and space, as it were, in the body, from that feedback is all important. So you can almost, I'm not suggesting we do, but you can almost feel your way through the tissues without actually needing to see what you're doing in some instances. Um, so, so that is, is, is highly relevant to touch. Um, and then I suppose, you know, moving on from there, um, after, after you've hopefully you know, done whatever you needed to do, 
then at the end of the day, the, the, the sort of the end of the encounter with the patient is again with the, the final handshake and the touch from that. So, you know, it's the sort of thing that one could talk about forever uh, in terms of how it's relevant and that sort of thing. But, um, but that just sort of gives you a, an idea. Um, and in terms of the feedback, I mean, just an idea of how you yourselves might experience the sorts of feedback we get is when you're, when you're say, operating in the kitchen on your fruit and veg, for example, um, you would feel the difference if you're cutting through a banana with the skin on, you'll go through the skin of the banana, then into the softness of the banana itself. Or if you're cutting through a pear, for example, you'll know the difference between cutting into a ripe pear versus an unripe pear. So those are the sorts of things that you will experience when you're using knives and forks and that sort of thing. And we, we have, have the same. I suppose the difference is that the vegetables and fruit don't talk back to us. I imagine as medics, you get quite a lot of commentary on, or, or compliments or non-compliments on, 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 um, on your tactile interactions, but um, perhaps we'll leave, that, <laughs> we'll leave that for later on. Um, thank you very much, James, that was fascinating. Wonderful. I think um, it's so interesting to hear those three equally profound but very different um, uh, outlines of how touch plays into people's working lives. Um, so thank you very much indeed for that. Um, before we move on, Claudia, we wanted to um, ask if you would drill down into a bit more detail for us on a certain aspect of the touch test um, and how what it revealed about how much people sort of hunger for touch and, and whether you sort of saw a pandemic effect, as it were. Um, it'd be really interesting to hear about that. Yeah, so we started collecting the data in January 2020 um, and we finished collecting the data near the end of March 2020. More people filled it in near the beginning. Um, and so, and people were from around the world, but many from the UK, very, very few from China. So at the time when people were filling it in, in January and February, that was, that was pre-pandemic for most people. Um, and then there's a bit of data that's after the pandemic, but we can use um, the data that there is from um, other studies, which people then did deliberately during the pandemic and, and try and uh, see the differences there. So we found, so pre-pandemic, we found that just over half of people, so 54% of people said they felt they didn't get enough touch in their lives. 42% had the right amount of touch, which is quite nice. And 3% said they had too much touch. Um, and uh, we were also looking at the reasons for this. And so 43% um, of adults felt that society didn't enable them to touch enough. Um, and that the leading reason why they thought uh, touching enough was difficult were issues uh, around consent. Um, and then one of the things we were really interested in, as I was saying before, was whether there is less touch than there used to be. Um, and it's always very hard to measure these things because you can you can do a big study now asking all these questions. But if someone hasn't asked them the exact same questions before, say, 50 years ago, ideally, or 30 years ago, then it's very hard to, to measure those differences over time. But we asked people what their perception of that was. Um, and half thought that there was just the same amount as before, uh, but a third thought there was less touch than there used to be and that there used to be more of it. Um, we did find towards um, the last, the very last week of people filling in the touch test, so when the pandemic had um, taken hold here, um, there was a drop, um, we, we saw, started seeing a trend towards a drop um, in well-being. And if we looked at other studies, so for example in the States, uh, Tiffany Field, um, it's a psychologist who's who's in Miami, who's done a lot of work um, on touch. And even in, in America, by the end of April, 68% of people were feeling touch deprived. So it is clear that, as you would expect, we couldn't touch each other. Um, and so uh, people started to, to notice that. Um, she also looked actually at um, what substitutes people used and found that people were finding the most effective substitutes for touch were um, exercise, um, and eating were the things they found most useful. Now, obviously, um, a lot of us might have eaten more during the pandemic with little else to do, um, and um, little else that's fun to do. And uh, obviously, exercise is, is more sustainable in the long term as an alternative to eating. But she found very much that if people say went running, they stopped missing um, the touch as much, which I, th I think is interesting. Um, 
uh, and uh, there's also research that's been done in, in Germany as well, a German research that's that's got looked across many countries and again found not surprisingly that people have felt deprived of touch um, during the pandemic. And in the uh, series that uh, I made called The Anatomy of Touch, we had a whole week of programmes on, on Radio 4. There were um, uh, nine programmes in one week looking at all sorts of different aspects of touch that I, that I presented. And in those, I spoke to several people who were unable to touch people for specific reasons. For example, there was um, a mother with an adult son who'd had a motorbike accident um, and he was in a residential home. So he had very, very severe injuries um, and brain injuries too. And she now wasn't able to touch him. And of course, lots of us will have heard those, those stories of people being deprived of touch and deprived of um, the touch from visitors, particularly in, in residential homes and how hugely, hugely um, difficult um, that has, has been for people. And one of the substitutes that people mentioned, uh, that, that was mentioned when I was interviewing psychologists about it was people could try to use words instead um, and that if you were missing touch, you should try to communicate what you would say through words. Um, but sometimes I think this is it, it is too difficult. And there was um, an occasion during the uh, it was in August last year. My um, best friend's father had died during the during the pandemic, not not from COVID. But I went to his funeral with her and there was um, a moment where and we knew we couldn't she and I you know, couldn't touch each other or hold hands or hug or anything. And there was a moment where his hearse, the hearse came up with his coffin in it and it needed to be a silent moment, um, but it felt so wrong. I didn't hold her hand, but it felt so wrong and mean not to do that. And I noticed so keenly how how touch is so important at times like that. And I could have tried to communicate through words, but I would have had to say, you know, we're here for you. I know how terrible this must be. We, we feel so sorry for you. And he was so lovely and this must be so difficult. That would have interrupted all of the moment by saying that. And yet just holding hands and squeezing a hand. Would have would have done all that in a different way and so i think it's it's really come home to a lot of people how powerful touch is i think now that we can't have it yeah absolutely um we have a couple of questions that you might like to take on um one is um do you def are we defining touch as a touch of the hand or is all skin on skin contact classed as touch Yes. Yeah, so in the general questions where we're asking people, when were you touched recently, then that would be skin on skin contact. But we also asked very specific questions where we we had um, figures of the um, body and people could fill in on those. Um, you could uh, click on different areas to show whether you liked or didn't like being touched by, say, a stranger or a friend in those um, areas. Um, and those were quite interesting because we found that 79% um, of people liked being touched by a friend and they liked being touched best on their arms or their upper back, which was quite interesting. And 63% of people disliked being touched by a stranger. And often it was only hands that were marked on the map as the place where they were happy to be touched, which is interesting because hands are very personal in one way. And one thing that people said to me a lot during the, when I was doing the touch programs during the pandemic was that they wouldn't be sorry if handshakes never came back. Um, and so it's interesting that actually that <coughs> the hand was the one place where people found it acceptable for strangers to touch them. Mm. That's interesting because we've had another question about handshakes and I think it would be nice to hear your views, but also James's view on this. Um, because he's talked so much about how his encounter with a patient begin, begins and ends with a handshake. Um, and Susan is asking whether you think the pandemic will affect the etiquette around touch going forwards, i.e. accepted practices such as handshakes, hugging friends and family. I mean, James, do you just want to say something about that quickly first, whether you think it will change your interactions with patients or whether you'll revert back to the good old days? Well, that, that is a very interesting thought. I mean, yes, at the moment, whenever we see a patient, we are not shaking hands at all. Whereas in the past, that would have been almost the first thing to do, as long as the patient didn't have a, have, didn't have a painful hand, you know, mm. through or for whatever reason, um, which might be a reason why they wouldn't want to shake hands. But I think um, before the pandemic, then we have always been uh, very aware of uh, transmitting infection through hand touch. And so most hospitals these days, for example, they have a bare below the elbow policy um, so that to show that you are aware of the risks of transmitting uh, infection, um, to show that you can wash your hands easily, you know, after each and every patient encounter. Um, 
I mean, I, I, I think on balance, we probably will go back to um, where we were, but I think it probably is going to take a while. And there may be some patients who just decide, well, actually, I'm done with handshaking. Um, and they may well be you know, very open about it. And so actually, do you mind if I don't shake hands? But no, I, I think that is a, a very interesting thought. And it, I don't know which way it's going to go. Uh, I think it will be will vary, as Claudia has suggested, I think it will be, will vary between individuals. Yes, I think yeah, what Claudia, did you want yeah, yeah. I, I think what will happen is that people will have more more choice about the matter in a way. So I think some people people will shake hands again, but there'll be an option not to, and almost maybe a bit of a pause before people do it. I mean, I think in, in one way, because the pandemic has been such a shock, it's easy to to sort of think you know everything has changed forever. But we did have many more years of doing things the other way before this weird year, 18 months, two years, however long it turns out to be, of doing stuff in a different way. And so a bit as if, you know, people are saying, you know, they can't imagine what it will be like going to a pub again until you go to a pub again. And then you say, oh, this was what it was like. Now I, now I remember. And the next time it's not as weird. And so I think that it will come back. But I think there may be more choice about when you, when you touch and when you hug and, and a pause and people may stay away from each other a bit and wait to see what the other one wants. And almost perhaps people will start asking permission more before they touch, which in some ways, in some circumstances, won't be a bad thing. And it might give people more options about touch that they don't feel is appropriate as well, which would be a good thing. And so we had a question for you, Jane, that was really about sort of touch and belief. He's seeing is believing is actually half of the original quotation, which is seeing is believing, but feeling is the truth. Um, and as an artist, what do you think touching does if vision already tells you everything you need to know? Um, thank you. I, I, I think it's such an interesting question because... Um, I think in a lot of my work, I've always been interested in the idea of whether something's real or not. Um, and so in some uh, pieces of work, I've, I've directly addressed that, thinking about um, one that I showed at the Fitzwilliam a few years ago called Evidence of Doubt. Um, and so, you know, that idea of belief about something um, is, is uh, resonant for me. And I'm not sure that vision does tell us everything we need to know you know I, I think that in especially in the modern digital age um, thinking about deep fake imagery um, and there's that it you know there's so much uh, it's so easy to deceive the eye and I think it's a great deal harder to deceive us deceive ourselves by touch um, so I think we do rely on physical touch to affirm the reality of something and maybe to talk a little bit more about this, maybe I'd like to first speak more about the physicality again of, of making drawings and the nature of the reality of the materials and the process, because for me, that, that is <laughs> what touch is all about. Um, and, and that combined with the alignment of why you're making something as well. It, it, it makes the idea of touch being an arbiter of truth um, perhaps a bit clearer. This is a piece which is again from the regeneration project and as I said the you know braille suite as you can see was quite different from this. Um, so uh, within the regeneration project I, I began to use um, a method called frottage which is basically taking rubbings. I mean that's that's kind of what it is. Um, and you know, for me, reading Braille and doing frottage, they're, they're, they're quite similar. They're, there's such a sensitivity required. Um, it's almost as though you're touching a sensate body. Um, you know, when we touch another body, the sensing is reciprocal. Um, with Braille or with making a, rub a rubbing, obviously the, there's only one surface which is feeling something and that's your fingers. Um, but the rubbing surface itself is explored and understood in such a way and to such an extent that it's almost, for me, it, it, it is almost like it's a sensate body. And, um, you know, it's a little bit like massaging or something like that. You're, you're, you're going over the surface so many times and in, at so many different speeds and with so much, different kind of pressure, maybe with different tools. 
Um, and so the touch is different depending on the, the type of tool, the, 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 the softness of the graphite or whatever it is that you're using to make the rubbing on this um, uh, a kind of relief surface. Um, and so in the case of this image that you're seeing now, um, this was a, a, a painting. So it's a relief painting, which has then been rubbed. Um, and I throw the painting away and I keep the rubbing. Um, so there's a sort of reverse hierarchy, if you like, of, of the imagery. I, I, I kind of keep the thing that's the ghost of, of the object itself. And so the, the whole idea then about, well, you know, which one is the real one also comes in. Um, I think there's a different sense of touch within drawing as well, the, the nature of touch. You know, um, to touch with the point of a pencil it's like imposing something, um, the thing being drawn, the, th the drawing that you end up with, you know, it's an inherently, it's not real. It, it's your thought and you've then made marks with a point and imposed that mark on the piece of paper. Um, I think, you know, there's a, it, it, it's not insignificant that we can't use drawings as legal proof, for example, because they are an invention. Whereas with the idea of frottage, it's so different because, um, you know, you start out with something that exists. So in that case, you know, it's a painting, it's a relief painting, or it might be, you know, you might be rubbing a gravestone. People tend to do that sort of thing or, um, you know, uh, any, any kind of surface. Yes. Yeah. And, and that already exists so that it already is real and you're just bringing it into vision. Mm -hmm. So you, you change the way that you look at the thing, but the thing is real to start with. Mm -hmm. And by your exploration of it and the way that you touch it, I think it makes it more real for the person doing the rubbing. Um, and I think also, you know, touch, it, it's so inherent in the methodology in printmaking as well. The idea of transferring from a surface, one surface to another. Um, that, that sort of sense of um, replication uh, of, of, of touch. Um, so if we could, maybe to illustrate this, could we have a look at the, there's um, Mary, uh, Marianne Rashik's uh, handprints of artists. Uh, and again, you know, this wasn't actually a piece that's it, thank you. Um, this wasn't a piece that I knew about, uh, but um, she was using handprints uh, for palmistry. And uh, I, I found it fascinating reading again in the catalogue ab about this. Um, and, you know, the idea of, of a handprint, okay, so this is a transfer of a real object. It's proof that this hand exists. Um, I mean, we use fingerprints in forensic work, so that there is that uh, in, inherently that idea that, it, that it's reality. And as I've said, uh, you know, other senses, they're much more open to deception and to manipulation. And indeed, I found it really interesting in the catalogue that Rashig apparently talked about um, the handprint specifically being um, a, a better arbiter of, of truth of the person's personality rather than the face, because with a face you can alter your expression. So you can lie with your face, you can't lie with your handprint. Mm. Um, so this is a, a lithograph of mine from uh, 1994. And it's, um, you know, the, the, the process of making lith lithographs, it's um, again, the, the premise, is, um, the method itself, the premise of it is that one material resists another. And so it's oil and water and the idea of something touching and it, and it pushes it off again. And you try and push it back on and it'll push it off. And, and it's an incredibly uh, difficult and sensitive um, method to make work. And so I found that interesting for doing this series of prints called Trace, which were based on the idea of fingerprints again, but in my case, rather than in Rashig's, you know, they weren't real fingerprints, they're invented ones. But what I found partly because of the um, process was by the time I'd done some of these prints, um, 
I ended up with my own fingerprints in oh. inside the the print there. Um, so they're sort of embedded. The 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 real and the invented mm. are there together. So you know, that's f for me kind of um, just a, a, a perhaps an idea about that that sense of touch being what helps us to believe in something. Mm. Thank you. That's um, really enlightening. Thank you very much. Um, James, we. I mean, it's interesting how um, Jane has talked about touch and helping you believe. Um, I mean, that's one of the things that we came across time and again in the show is the role of touch in belief and emotion, you know, that it's not always necessarily the most rational um, uh, of human encounters. And, and we wondered when you're working, you know, as a medic, as a hand surgeon, do you find that people have a lot of fear around touch or losing touch? What, what, what are the sort of emotions that you're dealing with around touch? Um, well, there are, there are, I mean, I think in terms of touch, I think um, there's the idea about whether or not we can or want to turn it on or off, for example, um, because the, the, uh, many occasions in which people won't want to be touched is because they have pain and the area that you might be touching might be painful. So particularly following surgery, for example, it's not unusual for scars to be particularly sensitive and tender. Um, and particularly scars in the hand, then uh, they, they could be particularly tender. And the key thing there is to reassure patients that in fact, it is important that they get on and they do touch their hand and get used to touching it again. I mean, some patients, if they've had an operation that the dressing comes off and they look at their hand and they're sort of terrified or horrified and they sometimes they don't even want to look at it. Uh, and in those cases, there's a potential danger that if they don't become accustomed to their hand, the surgery that they've had, then they'll sort of stop using that hand and it will start becoming more sensitive and more of a problem. So you need to reassure them. This is you know, just a few patients. You need to reassure them, encourage them to massage the scars with moisturizing cream so as to desensitize them, get their hand used to being touched again. Um, it's often the case that when a patient, for example, is in a plaster cast, you take the cast off. And you know, sometimes they might they might faint or or feel particularly queasy, because I often explain to them that a hand is so used to being touched and having air flowing over it and uh, receiving stimuli from a number of different ways, that when you wrap it up, when you first take it out of the dressing or out of the cast, it's a bit like after you've been in a dark room and then you come out into the bright sunshine and your eyes hurt. And a hand can be like that because it has so many nerve endings in it that it, it just isn't used to being wrapped up for long. So yes, there are times when we need to sort of re-educate patients into, into using their hands, being confident with them, um, and just therefore getting on top of that overreaction of the nerves. Um, and sometimes that can become a real problem. And in that situation, uh, if the nerves continue to fire off inappropriately, giving painful signals, um, then that's when you might need to start sort of resort to, to drug therapy to dampen down their nerves. But I try and leave that as a last resort and really encourage the patient, reassure them, get them back to using their hands. And, and that's when things do really start settling down. Fascinating. Um, Eleanor, we've got a really nice question in the Q&A about um, whether there's been a less of, uh, sorry, a loss of dexterity in young people because of the reduction in hands-on art and craft activities in early years and primary education um, and a, you know put in a sort of general context of whether um, in this digital age do we need to build touch back into the education of our children um, I don't know whether Claudia you wanted to I think probably all of our panelists might have something to say about that but Claudia would you like to yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting, of course, how many digital things now do involve us touching, you know, that we're, that we're constantly touching and swiping at our screens and that uh, toddlers are very adept at doing that and learn it very fast and can mm. use an iPad very, very fast and seem to take to it very intuitively. I, I, um, I'd be interested to know whether I, I have spoken to um, surgeons and I talked to surgeons, in fact, in the um, uh, in the touch test series I did who said that they felt that their students were coming in, their new, their new students were coming in and having less dexterity because they hadn't done crafts and that they were getting them to do crafts in their spare time. I don't know whether this is something that's anecdotal. And I don't know whether it's something that James has noticed. 
No, it's not something that I've noticed personally, but it does remind me of a, um, a particular surgeon I worked for many years ago when I was a, a trainee. And I remember him telling the houseman that he ought to go and spend some more time at home putting up shelves so that he got better used to handling the power tools and things needed to become a, an orthopedic surgeon. So I think <laughs> practicing, practicing manual dexterity must be important. And I think there's this business about 10,000 hours and becoming an expert. Um, I think, yes, practicing the use of your hands must help. And I think if people are missing out on that sort of model making activity, then I would think that I'm not saying that they would never be able to develop that skill, but I think it would take them a time, take them a time to do that, I would have thought. Um, yeah, but no, it's, it's, it's an interesting point. Yeah. I was looking recently at um, x-rays of hands from the age of, you know, a baby up until, I don't know, um, teenage years and the, how the cartilage sort of disappears and more muscle. Uh, so you, ba a baby's touch will be, and dexterity will obviously be very, very different to, um, and uh, I mean, I have, um, yeah, small children at home and their hands feel totally alien. I, I, and it's not to because to, i i mean before i had my own children i hadn't really spent a lot of time with children all over me so it is it, i found <laughs> felt it very strange um I, I hadn't really thought i've given it a lot of thoughts that um the difference between children's touch and um and 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 that of adults but it is very different no well, that that's a very interesting point of it because my understanding is that a child doesn't have the same degree of sensitivity in their hands as an adult does which is why one of the first things they'll do when you give them something is they'll put it in their mouth mm -hmm. um, because they got better sensitivity that way. That's Definitely. very true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Excellent. Um, we wanted to ask you all, actually, um, whether you could recall your earliest memories involving touch and whether from childhood and whether they are strong recollections for you. Jane, perhaps you'd like to take this one first. <laughs> yes, well, I, it, I was a bit sort of concerned about that because I couldn't really think of anything where <laughs> it, it, it necessarily, um, you know, there was perhaps nothing that stuck out for me in, in terms of touch. Um, um, I, I think that the, the idea of perhaps being isolated, uh, of not being touched, maybe that's something that you can uh, really remember. If, you know, I'm not saying it happened very often, but if it did and, and, and the sort of anxiety that that provokes, I do have memories of that. Um, whereas I think perhaps the idea where you are touched and and calmed by that touching, you know, it just perhaps sinks into your way of thinking of that being the norm, the normal state that you mm. would be in. So it, it's perhaps in that sense less memorable. Mm. Claudia. Yeah, I'd say when I, when I thought about this question, I thought my earlier memories about touch would have been um, we had a, a, you know, a dog that was we got the dog. I was 10 months old when the dog came along. So I'd grown up very much with this dog. And so um, obviously stroking the dog and, and um, thinking to what Eleanor was saying, presumably in that, you know, in that toddler way at first where, you know, you get the, you do it the wrong way going up the fur, which obviously they don't like very much. And then parents try and get them to stroke nicely. Um, and of course, and, and I think um, stroking, you know, people or animals is interesting because everyone learns to do it at this certain speed, which is about three centimeters a second. And that it was only discovered in the 90s that we have these particular nerve fibers called C's, C tactile afferent fibers, which seem to be there just to give us pleasure when someone strokes your hand at that particular rate. And it's the sort of rate that we all know. And, and it's thought that it's only there to, to give us pleasure and to help people bond together because humans cooperating is, is you know, part of our success. And so that was bit, that the your your thing about early memories made, made me think of that and of of, of stroking mm -hmm. the dog and how how early once people once toddlers can do it a bit more smoothly how they still do it at this speed that they may be shown by the adults but that we soon know what this speed is that soothes us and that is very very soothing someone else doing that to you and it's the speed you would you know stroke someone's forehead at if they were if they were ill and you were trying to help them. Interesting. Thank you, James. No, well, you know, I you know, had to think quite hard about this one, but I think 
I think that the things that struck me most is the those feelings that you least expect when you touch something. So in terms mm. of sort of in early years, I guess it was being licked by a cat. And you think, well, how can this thing's tongue be so rough? You know, it was just that that really did strike me. And then much uh, later on in development, um, in fact, during my medical school finals, and I think this emphasizes the importance of touch. Um, for the first time, I'd never seen a patient with this condition, but I saw a patient with neurofibromatosis. Now, in that condition, the patients have lots of little nobbles all over the body that look little, I don't know, about smaller than a centimetre, but they look like hard little spaced out pebble dash. And you think they're going to be sort of rubbery things that, I don't know, you might rub up and down and it would almost make a noise. Um, but when I touched one, it just sort of disappeared. It was, all, it was as though it was full of air and it just sort of pushed into the skin with minimal resistance. I suppose a little bit like the end of a balloon that's not fully blown up. It's just very sort of soft and squidgy. And it was just amazing to see this, this sort of, condition that looked so physically robust and tough and yet it was just sort of almost full of air so I think that was in terms of medical exposure to to touch that was a big eye-opener uh, through my fingertips. Interesting I think we we've got one very important question that it would be fantastic to put to Claudia as probably our last one um, which is what does your research tell us about neurodivergent people and touch? Yeah, it's very interesting actually. So we did ask ask people um, uh, whether they uh, were neurodiverse, and we asked people you know all sorts of questions. And what we found was interesting because it is often um, it, it's, it can become a, a part of a, a sort of stereotype that nobody with autism spectrum spectrum disorder likes being touched, and. And that turned out very much not to be the case. It is absolutely the case for some people and they find it very difficult or do not like it. And other people do like it and like being like can like being held and, and find that very comforting. And of course, you know, people are very different. And so we actually found that 41 percent of people with who filled in the survey who had autism spectrum disorder felt that society doesn't enable us to touch enough, which we thought was really interesting because that maybe people were not touching them, assuming that they wouldn't like it when in fact, they felt they wanted more opportunities to touch or maybe they were feeling discriminated against in, in, in other ways in that. And also I mentioned that the words that people said um, when they um, associated with touch and it was interesting that the word, um, I saw an, an, another word, yes, yeah, so, so people um, who were neurotypical said comforting, warm and love were their three words. Um, people with ASD reported comforting, uncomfortable and warm were their three words. So uncomfortable was the word that came second, showing that it divided people and it divided people more than it did the neurotypical people. But but some were um, some people were longing for it. So I thought it was I think there's lots to more to investigate there. And it would be nice to see bigger studies on that, actually. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I think we are coming to the end of the session. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating. Um, even Eleanor and I, who've been sort of living and breathing touch for the last um, two or three years, I've learned so much. It's been absolutely brilliant. I'm sure you feel the same, Eleanor. Yes, I do. Thank you very much. I was, um, I was trying to remember, I read recently, I think it must have been on Twitter, that there's a German word that, trans and I can't remember the German word, but it's fing it translates as fingertips feeling. And it's, um, it's not just about the touch, it's about uh, a physical touch, it's about sort of a more conceptual thing of um, true instinct, sort of deft touch. And I think the three of you uh, embody that in different ways. Um, thank you very much. Yes, huge thanks. We've we've spent a lot of time reading articles that say uh, touch is the forgotten sense, but I I think we've shown this evening that there's really an incredible richness to it. So thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your experiences. It's been absolutely brilliant.